So this is going to be your third talk in a row that has to do with uh, boreal caribou cows. Um, I would suggest that um, this talk is from an area which has got the least altered landscape pattern currently for boreal caribou. And as Craig did, um, I'd like to get my acknowledgements done first so that if I run out of time I don't mess up on them. But um, if it wasn't for them, there'd be nothing to say here. I would like to acknowledge Dennis Denon, Chief of the San Mike Denny Band, then Lloyd Chico, Chief of the Kagatu First Nation, who in 2003 had the foresight to see the need for a scientifically based research study on boreal caribou that would augment the traditional knowledge in these communities and come up with a better understanding of boreal caribou ecology in the area in face of the Mackenzie Gap Pipeline project. It didn't take too long for the other First Nations in the area to see the value of having this research conducted on their traditional lands. And subsequently, Lilikew First Nation, Fort Simpson Mady Local, Jimiri River First Nation, Nahani Butte Denny Band, Apo Denny Koi Band, and the Petsuki First Nation came on board and we started what is called the Boreal Caribou or the Dacia Boreal Caribou Study. Some of the information from this study you will have seen in in Marco's presentation, Dacho North, Dacho South, has been used in the national work. We wouldn't have had anything done if it hadn't been for Brad and Diane and Diversified Environmental who have deployed the majority of the callers on our caribou. Great Slave Helicopters has been the ones providing our smooth surveys. In March, Telonix has provided all the satellite GPS callers, and my government and the Government of Canada have funded things. Boreal caribou in the Northwest Territories have a continuous distribution from about the 60th parallel north up until just south of the Mackenzie Delta. Boreal, uh, collared female boreal caribou in various parts of the Northwest Territories have shown their ignorance to jurisdictional boundaries and have made forays into the Yukon Territory, into northeastern BC and northwestern Alberta. Conversely, we know of collared females in BC and Alberta that have made forays up into the Southern Northwest Territories. The area in blue is the Dacho study area, which I will be talking to today. The Dacho region is approximately 160,000 square kilometers. The majority of the landscape is dominated by boreal forested habitat. To the western side, we have the Mackenzie Mountains, and that's the range of mountain caribou. The red outline here encompasses all of the locations we have of our female boreal caribou that have been collared since from 2004 to 2012. And it covers approximately 80,000 square kilometers. Of course, in order to get this information, there was a need to have collared animals because we needed to get location data so that we could determine movement patterns, etc., etc. Caribou are live captured in the Northwest Territories, no drugging. They're captured with a net gun fired from a helicopter. We follow the standard operating procedure, the Northwest Territories Animal Care Committee, which has also been endorsed by all our First Nations partners and the Dejo Boreal Caribou Working Group. We deployed either Argos DS or GPS satellite callers, Talonics. Our DS callers provided us with daily locations. GPS callers provided us with locations every eight hours, three locations a day. And since 2004, we've deployed DS callers on 56 females and GPS callers on 43 females in the area. Now, some of John Nagy's research looked at a detailed analysis of movement patterns of all types of caribou throughout the Northwest Territories. One part of this story, and we've heard this not only from talks before, but we also knew it from traditional knowledge, is female boreal caribou move very little at calving. Now, based on analysis of the movement patterns of the boreal caribou females throughout Northwest Territories, John came up and discovered this very distinct pattern of movement that we see from boreal caribou females when they calve. Now this pattern was based on 108 events using GPS collars, followed up with checking to see if the animals actually had calves and or 
having their progesterone levels that we recorded in the February before they calved. So as you can see, they're trucking along fairly well up until two days before calving, and then we just have a die-off. And to answer Don's question here, for 10 days, we're way, way, way down. They just don't move. And as was indicated yesterday, the only time you'll see a large movement there is when we know a wolf has come in, either got the caribou calf right there or chased something, and you'll see a 30-kilometer movement, and you know, uh-oh, we've had an accident afterwards. So what we have done, and uh, we've done a first cut on the data, so we're not nearly as sophisticated as being up at the RSF model pr procedure yet. But what we have done is we took this movement pattern and went back through all of the data that we had on collared females back to 2004, made sure that we had locational data from the 1st of May through the 15th of June, and tried to determine what happened with our calving events past. We had a potential of 205 calving events that we could look at. Slightly different from your abstract if you're checking because uh, we rushed this thing in and the numbers weren't quite ready. But as you can see, of those 205 potential events, based on the movement pattern data, we had 189 calvings. There were 12 instances where calving did not occur based on the movement pattern, and there was four events where things were equivocal. Three of those four events were when we had radio collars that were on their last legs and were just sputtering off and we didn't feel confident that they had provided us enough information right through to the 15th of June. So we plotted the days when calves were born. Now, as I alluded to earlier, the Dato study area is divided into north and south at about the 62nd parallel, which is roughly where the Mackenzie River bisects. So from years 2004 all the way up to 2012, dates in May, 189 in total, 85 in the north, 104 in the south. So a few things came out here. Calving has occurred only from the 7th to the 31st of May. Calving starts earlier in the south and tends to be longer in the south. Now, this little object here, we had all but one calf born in 2008 by the 21st of May the very last calf of the collared females that we had was born on the 31st of May. Now if we plot this a little bit differently, here what we've got is frequency occurrence of the Julian day for calving. Again, total study area broken down into north and south. It's a little bit more, uh, it shows things a bit better. We had a 16 day period in the north when calving has occurred versus a 26 day period in the south. And even if we get rid of that outlier, we've got a 23 day period. The median calving date in the south was one, Julian date 135, was 137 in the north. And then what we did is we looked at the date when at least half of the calves had been born each year, followed that, and that has to do with this red bar up here. In the last nine years, 50% of the calves born in the south were born by either Julian day 132 to 136, so fairly tight even though we've got a wide, wide calving time, 50% of them are born earlier than in the north and in a short span. When we compare to the north, we only have, we have one fewer year of data because the first year we didn't have callers in the north. But for eight years, 50% of the calves were born between Julian days 133 and 141. So over much, so much var more variability in when we've got calves out there in the north and in the south. So then we did a little digging and we decided to look at the calving dates of individual females. And it was stunning. There was a remarkable individual consistency in calving dates. We didn't have any evidence that a cow that had calved each year for four years, things were being delayed or getting later. We had a sample size of 13 females that had calved in each year for four consecutive years. Eight of the 13 calved during a Julian day period of less than seven days. Two of these calved during a three-day Julian day period. Two of our 13 females had three calves born on exactly the same Julian day. Eight had two of their four calves born on exactly the same day. The widest period for two of those females was 12 Julian days. 
and we're waiting for this year's calving period because one female that we collared in February 2010 has had her calf born on exactly the same Julian day 2010, 2011, 2012. Now when you're talking boreal caribou, fidelity of calving locations is a, a topic of discussion and it, and it will be here. We have the, the issue of determining or, or trying to decide and define what fidelity really is. Um, but what we'll do is we'll put this into a little bit of a background for the date show anywhere. And the data that we used here is based on the movement patterns we could determine the point location of where calves were born. So we determined the locations of each of the calvings. We measured the distance between consecutive years and then we measured the maximum distance between any of the calving events that female had had. So in the date show, we know boreal caribou females can live to 17 years. They can produce a viable calf at 16 years old. So we're looking at a data set here that covers three to four, four years. They have to bring that into the, not the thought of your definition of fidelity. Anyways, we got a lot of individual variation, which is something that we expected. But there's certainly a lot of argument to indicate that at least some individuals are highly fidel at least over that four year period, whereas others certainly are not. Six of our females had successive calving locations less than 1,300 meters away. One female calved the following year less than 300 meters away from her calving site before. The mean maximum distance between all the four calving sites or calving locations for three of the females was under six kilometers. But contrastingly, we had three females there where the average distance was over 30 kilometers. So there certainly would have a good argument for fidelity for some of these. These ones, I don't know. And the question arises in our area too. Individual fidelity over a short period of time of maybe three to four years may have some very important implications if you've got some short scale land use planning practices that are going to be going ahead. Now the last little piece of information we looked at was calf survival. We started helicopter surveys in, in March of 2008. Therefore, in every March we re relocate all of our collared females. We determine if that collared female is accompanied by a calf, and hence we can determine the fate of that calf over its first nine months, because we know that based on movement patterns, which females had calves. So we have data for 53 different females, and they have a variety of different births. We have one female who had four births in that period of time. She managed to survive 50% to recruitment. So she had a calf the first year that survived, the second year her calf didn't. Third year it survived, fourth year it didn't. Interestingly, when we look at the 10 females who had three births that we could track, mean survival is 33%. But we had two of those females had three calves every year their calf made it through. Five females had three calves and none of their females made it through or none of their calves made it through. We see a similar trend in the 24 females with two births where a number of them have two for two and a number are zero for two, kind of nothing in the middle. So the question then arises if we got some good or lucky mothers out there in the population and a bunch of poor or unlucky mothers out there in the population and of course, if we've got this dichotomy here, there's some population genetic implications. And I'm going to finish right on time there for you, Mike. <laughs> Massey Joe, thank you very much. <laughs>